I think they could have made the voice a bit. <laughs> But I'd just like to say welcome to everyone who's joined us this afternoon. Oh, I have to say a beautiful autumn day for me anyway, in the east of England. It's really beautiful here. Uh, I'm so glad to be back after summer. We had a little bit of a break, but we are now back. My name's Ashley Percival Worley. I'm one of the trustees for the Combined Military Services Museum. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Claire Hubbard Hall. And she is a historian and an author specializing in the history of women in secret intelligence. Oh, very exciting. <laughs> um, you're also a founding member of Women Intelligence Network as well, Claire. Absolutely. Yes. And I have to say, that uh, Claire is also writing a book called Miss Money Paying, which is um, the forgotten women of Britain's intelligence service. Is that right? Or British intelligence? British uh, intelligence. Yeah. yeah. What a title. <laughs> what a title. And that's going to be published in 2024. Yeah, July. in July, July 2024. Yeah. Uh, sign me up. I've, you've got to, <laughs> you know, there's a copy for me waiting, surely, because <laughs> that sounds wonderful. It sounds like a really amazing, amazing title. Um, but today we'll be talking about a slightly different woman in intelligence, and that's Virginia Hall. And I'm so excited because we're looking at the SOE and we're going to deep dive a little bit more specifically into uh, Virginia Hall's relationship with the SOE and also journalism, which I think is a really interesting relationship. I think it's going to be a really fascinating talk. So I'm so excited. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm absolutely in love with the SOE. And I'm so excited for this talk there. Uh, and just for you guys watching as well, um, please, if you have any questions, you pop them in the chat. And I will ask those questions to Claire at the end of the talk. So any questions at all, pop them in the chat. Really, really excited for this. Claire, thank you so much for joining us. And if anyone wants to come and see some extra special um, intelligence gadgets, bits and pieces, um, gosh, we have so much in the Combined Military Services Museum as well. So if you want to come, come and see us and take a look, it's wonderful. I'm very, very proud trustee of that museum. So Claire, really excited. Absolutely take it away. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Welcome, everybody. Thanks. And uh, like Ashley said, thank you for joining us on what is a beautiful autumnal afternoon. Okay, then. Right. So I'm, as a historian, slightly obsessed with women. Um, in intelligence and one of my favourite women I think um, bar one other which I can't talk about just yet which is the, the, the which um, I focus on in my forthcoming book um, is Virginia Hall and hopefully I'm going to share some of my um, love for why I think she is particularly well in the words of my 10 year old daughter awesome to put it in a 21st century phrase Okay then, so let's get started. Right, well during the Second World War, Allied intelligence services effectively weaponized journalism, using agents, operatives, working undercover as journalists and war reporters, as a means of intelligence gathering in hard to reach areas such as Vichy France. Journalism was, and still is of course, a trade that provides excellent cover for those working in the secret world. On the flip side, we also have reporters and writers during the Second World War who thought that they could best help defeat Hitler by writing propaganda for one of the information offices or by serving in one of the secret services such as SOE. A number of famous journalists and writers have been linked to the intelligence world, such as Roald Dahl and his work for the British Security Coordination during the war. Now, during the war, the Special Operations Executive, SOE, used Virginia Hall's journalistic cover as a means to have eyes behind enemy lines. And they trained her how to embed coded message messages within um, her news submissions, her reports. Now, Virginia Hall's very, very thick SOE personnel file can be consulted in the National Archives at Kew, and it offers a really unique insight into why she was initially sent to France and the importance of an agent's cover. SOE initially sent Virginia to occupied France for espionage purposes. They had no idea in those early months of occupation, German occupation, of what was going on behind enemy lines, and they had to solve this problem. So she was sent to occupied France 
for this particular purpose with her mission, which was to collect intelligence on the economic and political conditions, the situation. This soon expanded to include reports on German troop movements and the construction of submarine bases. And later she built up an effective spy network consisting of an army of loyal informants and master forgers and a network of established safe houses. Now, Virginia Hall can be seen here in this 2006 oil painting, which hangs on the wall in the CIA buildings in Langley, Virginia, where she worked for the CIA after the war. The painting is about a hundred and just over a meter um, in height and just under a meter in width. The artist Geoffrey Bass portrays Hall in the early morning hours, radioing London from an old barn near Le Chambon sur Lignon to request supplies and personnel. Power for her radio is provided by a discarded bicycle rigged to turn an electric generator, the clever invention of one of her captains, Edmund Lebrout. Using codes such as, and this was in French, the daisies will bloom tonight, she was informed of what airdrops to expect from London and when. So what was SOE? Well, it was formed in 1940, Winston Churchill's secret army. It was famously tasked with setting Europe ablaze. It operated as an underground army waging a secret war behind enemy lines in Europe and Asia. Its main task was sabotage and subversion behind enemy lines, known for its big bangs when blowing up communication and transport lines. Its director of operations was Brigadier Colin Gubbins, whose interest in irregular warfare originated from his service during the 1919-1920 Irish War of Independence. As an entirely volunteer force, SOE agents were subjected to what can be best described as a gruelling training regime. They were then parachuted, flown or transported by boat into occupied Europe and the Far East to work alongside resistance and partisan groups. It was hoped that by working with resistance forces, SOE agents would boost the morale of the occupied societies. Now, those who volunteered were a mix of serving soldiers, often with commando training, but also there were civilians too. But unique to SOE, its recruits were both men and women. In fact, it was the first time women were permitted in a combat role. Some of the women recruited were enlisted in the first aid nursing yeomanry known as fannies to disguise their secret work. SOE, SOE agents, both men and women, were trained to handle guns and explosives. They had to memorize complex codes, organize munitions and supply drops, be able to engage in unarmed combat, and they had to endure and survive harsh interrogation by the cruel and sadistic Gestapo. Agents were issued with suicide pills in their coat buttons in case they could not escape. They knew it was unlikely they would see their homes and family again, yet they accepted the risk. Unlike other special forces, SOE agents wore civilian clothes. This meant that they would be shot as spies if captured. And the average life expectancy of an SOE wireless operator in occupied France was just six weeks. It's all, I always find it just worthwhile just noting that the weight of what's known as the, as the, uh, the suitcase wireless, it, when you watch films um, that, that depict SOE agents carrying these suitcase wirelesses, it, they look like they're the light as a feather. Actually, they weigh an absolute ton. If you imagine the weight of a, of a tire, that's the equivalent to how much these actually weighed. Now, irregular warfare required irregular warriors and women were invaluable because their gender provided the perfect camouflage and helped keep them above suspicion behind enemy lines. Female agents had distinct advantages over men because women could travel freely 
in occupied France because they were not expected to be at work during the day, like the men were. Female agents received the same training as the men to the horror of some of the male agents who completely balked at the idea of sending women behind enemy lines. Now, the majority of women recruited were hired for clandestine service in France. The women of SOE were a force to be reckoned with, with those such as Pearl Witherington, seen here on the far right, who was the best shot of any man or woman to pass through SOE training. Now, women in particular were seen to be best suited to the role of courier. With no secure means of communication on the ground, couriers carried messages between circuits and sub-circuits, circuits, traveling very long distances, often by bicycle or train, memorizing their messages or writing them on silk paper or rice paper, which could be easily hidden or destroyed. Now, because they were constantly on the move, couriers ran the highest risk of being stopped and arrested. And for male couriers, that risk became greater with every day the war went on. Because from early 1942, all young men in France were liable to be picked off the street and unless they were classified as essential workers, were sent to Germany as forced labourers. Women, on the other hand, could invent a hundred cover stories as they moved around and aroused little suspicion. It was also considered that because women were less likely to be subjected to body searches, messages could be concealed in hems of skirts or even underwear. Now in September 1941, the American Virginia Hall was the first female SOE agent to be sent into France, and one of her roles was as a courier. Now her nationality, being American, America did not enter the war until December 1941, and her gender, along with her cover identity of being a journalist, allowed British intelligence to have a much needed pair of eyes of what was going on in German occupied France. However, she was an unlikely candidate for undercover intelligence work. She battled misogyny on a daily basis, and managed to smash through barriers of physical disability. As a young woman, Virginia Hall was fiercely independent and ambitious. Born into a wealthy Baltimore family in 1906, she was raised to marry, marry within her privileged class, but she wanted adventure. Her privileged upbringing meant that she had a love and an ability with languages, French, German, and Italian and she had long dreamt of joining the United States Foreign Service and had managed to secure an embassy post in Turkey in the early 1930s, where she had an unfortunate and debilitating accident. She shot her foot off in a hunting accident, which left her with a wooden leg, which she named Cuthbert, and as a consequence had a very pronounced limp when she walked. She would become known to the Gestapo as the limping lady and, according to some, was declared, quote, the enemy's most dangerous spy. Yet, interestingly, one of the, one of the um, many of the wanted posters put up around Lyon in late 1942, not one of them has survived. And there are questions if they even existed in the first place. Now, Virginia applied for foreign service three times after her, her accident, but all were rejected. She suspected that the real reason was perhaps because she was a woman. But Virginia did not let this stand in her way, and she went to work in France as an ambulance driver. However, when France fell to the Germans in June 1940, she fled to Britain via Spain. She worked as a clerk at the US Embassy, where she was asked to provide intelligence from her time in France. Virginia was just the type of recruit that the newly formed SOE was on the lookout for. At the end of 1940, 
She was recruited by Vera Atkins, an intelligence officer working in SOE's F section overseeing France, who was responsible for the female agents. And on the 19th of May, 1941, seen here, she signed the Official Secrets Act. Now, Virginia underwent her SOE training in the New Forest, where she was taught how to conceal microfilm in tiny containers and insert them into a handy slot in her metal heel. She was also subjected to simulated interrogation by SOE officers dressed in German uniforms, taking on the role of the Gestapo. But what became clear very quick, quickly was that her physical disability limited her training in guerrilla warfare. However, it did not limit her effectiveness to plan paramilitary operations where she used her exceedingly capable teams to execute future missions in France. Now, after completing her training, Virginia Hall was dispatched to France at the end of August 1941, under the cover identity of a journalist working for the American newspaper, The New York Post. Hall's nationality and so-called regular job of reporting provided the perfect cover story. And this was a key moment for SOE in Baker Street at its headquarters, because Virginia had broken the long silence in the political heart of France. In Vichy France, letters were censored and telephone conversations monitored. This meant that the transmission of intelligence concerning conditions in France was limited solely to Virginia's newspaper reports. As an American, she was permitted to travel in areas off limits to other foreign nationals, which enabled her to develop valuable contacts with French resistance groups and the later transmission of instructions to a growing network of SOE um, F section agents in the area. Her status as a journalist was her sole protection, and this is an important point. Her news reports served as a vital intelligence gathering medium that helped shape Allied commanders' perceptions of the battle space and inform tactical and strategic decisions. Her news reporting activity behind enemy lines meant that the supply of news reports came to rival similar to an ammunition supply in the conduct of war. Now, British intelligence, as a consequence, was able to build a news archive, transforming the logistics of perception during warfare, the ability to see and to see differently behind enemy lines through the use of covert sources utilizing open source information. And this raises some really interesting questions, which hopefully with a much bigger study on this in the future by myself or anybody else who wants to take it up, there are questions in terms of that, that can't fully be answered just through the case study of one woman, Virginia Hall and her SOE personnel file, but questions around the velocity of news reports did the speed in which reports were received impact accuracy in any way? The volume of news reports, was there under-reporting, over-reporting? When did this happen? What was the context? Authenticity, the accuracy of the intelligence provided in a coded news reports in a way shines a light on the process of how this material was decoded and interpreted back at HQ. And then there is precision. How did agents improve the precision of intelligence gathering? Did it create a more focus on clearer targets that perhaps hadn't been as clear to start with? And in a way, by recasting the wartime role and experience of agents such as Virginia Hall and their, using their journalistic cover, it's possible to engage in a preliminary examination of the really kind of com complex organizational issues surrounding the importance of secrecy, discretion, and trust within the cycle of intelligence gathering. Now, SOE, interestingly, 
did not approach the New York Post first. Within Virginia Hall's SOE personnel file, a memo dated <laughs> April Fools, the 1st of April, can you believe it, 1941, I don't think it was an April Fool's joke, reveals that a London-based correspondent of PM, a very left-wing paper in the US, um, they'd met with its owner, Ben Robertson, had met with Virginia and found her to be agreeable, and he gave his approval that she could go to France as a correspondent of the PM paper. However, the memo noted that SOE had to secure the consent of the paper's owner, Ralph Ingersoll, and the director of the paper, and that he should be approached tactfully and make it clear that SOE would pay all expenses and that Virginia would only be paid space rates by the paper for any material used because she'd had previous journalistic experience from her time at university working on the college paper. However, his consent was not forthcoming. So it was George Backer, the owner of the New York Post and who would later become the propaganda policy director of the US Office of War Information, who played an essential role in establishing Hall's credible cover story. Nicholas Boddington, the deputy head of F section, met with George Backer on the 20th of May 1941 at Claridge's, where else of course, where Backer handed him an attestation that Virginia Hall was a fully accredited correspondent of the New York Post and provided her cable company identification cards that she would need in the field. Boddington indicated that Backer was aware of the ulterior motive but had not let on that he knew and he had hinted to Boddington that he would no doubt be seeing him again in one month's time when he would be back in London from New York. Now, working under an alias, Brigitte Lecontre, Virginia's SOE reports were delivered under several code names. Vouched for and endorsed, Virginia read the French and German newspapers daily in Vichy, France, ever hopeful that she could rustle up a story or two from them. She was trained in a suitable code to include within her news articles sent via Western Union. However, not all her reports were published because sensitive topics such as those concerning political news and newspaper clippings were sent straight to SOE headquarters. And they can be found, some of them can be found that haven't been weeded out, can be found within her declassified SOE personnel file. And through a detailed review of her published and unpublished New York Post articles, it's possible to assess her contrib contribution to SOE's very early espionage efforts. But interestingly, SOE's espionage work was frowned upon by others such as Stuart Mingus, the head of MI6, who understandably viewed the existence of two sets of agents working independently in the same area at any one time as posing a big problem. Mingus saw SOE as, quote, amateur, dangerous and bogus, but there was nothing amateur or bogus about Virginia Hall's reports. On the 27th of September 1941, she wired the following news piece to the New York Post. You can see here on the slide. She wrote, the problem of the winter food supply in France is foremost in the papers. Minds of the population and the government, Mr. Charbin, Secretary for Food Supply, and Mr. Kazia, Minister of Agriculture, have both stressed the seriousness of the situation in a recent speech. Charbin broadcasting emphasised the fact the harvest this year have been exceptionally good and that the farmers will have plenty to eat. However, he says, speaking of supplying urban centres, today it is often hindered by drivers. The great material impediment is the lack of transportation, of course, as fuels become always scarcer. Fuel shortage had stopped secondary rail lines 
already leaving the transport problem to the vagaries of charcoal burning, trucks and buses, a dubious solution not even bordering on the adequate. So this following open source of intelligence hints at hunger, associated unrest in urban areas. Transportation has been affected by short fuel shortages and different fuels have had to be sourced, such as charcoal. Now, this was the only way the food could be transported and distributed. So British intelligence SOE were aware from this report of actually how dire the situation was in France at the end of September 1941. Now, alongside her journalistic activity, Virginia was tasked with assisting escaped prisoners of war and downed airmen after her contacts in the French resistance in Paris had received her messages. The years she spent in France before the war benefited her greatly because she inf as she influenced French citizens, both men and women, to cooperate and establish safe houses, which was extremely risky. And she ran these missions from Vichy in her apartment in Lyon. She frequented restaurants where she exchanged messages between her assets and she continued her cover on the side and reported on the deteriorating conditions of civilian life due to the war. And in a telegrammed uh, wired story to the New York Post dated the 4th of September 1941, she wrote, the years have rolled back here in Vichy. There are no taxis at the station, only half a dozen buses and a few one horse chaise. I took a bus using gazagine charcoal instead of gas to my hotel. Vichy is a tiny town used once by some visitors to take the cure. It is infinitely small place to accommodate the government of France and the French Empire, which was Com commandeered most of, of the hotels. So this, this short story, uh, this short news report conveys some interesting information to SOE back in London in terms of how to prepare its agents that are going to be dropped into this particular area of what they're going to face. Preparation was key. Now, Virginia learned to become less conspicuous by abandoning her pre-war Parisian wardrobe. She ditched her trademark trousers and dressed more demurely to avoid attention from French police or German masters. She learned how to change her appearance depending on who she was meeting, altering her hairstyle, wearing a wide brimmed hat, putting on glasses, changing her makeup, wearing different gloves to hide her hands, and the list goes on. But in late October 1941, disaster hit. Nearly all SOE agents and all radio operators in her network had been arrested and imprisoned. Virginia was the only one left and London's only hope. The future of Allied intelligence in France now rested on a solitary woman who had been written off for most of her adult life as in the words of her biographer, Sonia Purnell, a woman of no importance. And as winter of 1941 approached, perhaps the worst since the Napoleonic Wars, Virginia reported on the scarcity of clothes, especially bras because of the labor and multiple, multiple components involved. Leather stocks had been requisitioned by the German military, so there was a desperate shortage of normal shoes. The rudimentary footwear, sometimes still on sale in the shops, had wooden soles that clacked loudly as the wearers walked down the street, street, a wartime phenomenon that became the soundtrack to Nazi rule. Now, such mundane news was vital to SOE, who knew not to clothe its new recruits in good shoes, because if the agents were walking around in sparkly new leather shoes, they would immediately be conspicuous and identified and questioned. But Virginia chose to remain in situ. To explain her travel and irregular hours, her journalistic cover proved essential. 
She continued to write as often as she could and received a thousand franc bonus from her pleased New York Post editors. The more sensitive articles on political news were not published, but these were sent straight to SOE in London to avoid attracting attention to her. However, there was one exception. And this appeared in the New York Post on the 24th of November, 1941, date-lined Leon. And it told the world about the growing threat from Vichy's, with, from Vichy's repression of Jews. A follow-up article in the New York Post dated the 22nd of June 1942, the following year, broke the news that Jews in Paris had to wear the yellow Star of David. And the report was supplied by Virginia. It read, In Poland, the Jews are separated from the rest of the population, while from Hungary comes the news that Jews will be completely excluded from military service which in view of conditions on the Eastern Front probably doesn't grieve them too much. The Jews in Paris, meantime, are wearing the badge of their race, a five-pointed yellow star. That same month, in June 1942, it became evident that her cover had actually been blown because the American consul, Marshal Vance, had been interrogated by the Surette, the French police, as to whether he knew Virginia. SOE headquarters at Baker Street cabled the New York Post on the 28th of June to ask George Backer to summon her back via Lisbon for urgent consultations in the United States, although her real destination, of course, would be London. George Backer immediately obliged and even took responsibility for persuading the State Department to turn up the heat on Vichy to accelerate Virginia's visas. A recall by her newspaper was, of course, a plausible explanation for her sudden departure, which might otherwise put her Leon contacts in danger. In August 1942, Virginia received a visit from Nicholas Boddington, the deputy of F section, to discuss her future. Adamant that she should stay, Boddington gave in and recommended to London that it should cancel her recall. Baker Street agreed and asked the New York Post to confirm her position and commission more articles to maintain her cover. Virginia was sent three quarters of a million francs through the American military attaché in Vichy to continue her work. But Virginia finally conceded that she had to leave shortly thereafter. On the 21st of September 1942, she asked London to arrange her ticket for a clipper flight from Lisbon. She wanted to leave openly as the New York Post correspondent so that there would be no problems for those she was leaving behind. But she had to get to Lisbon first. So she hired a Spanish guide and journeyed on foot, or one foot as they should say, over the snow-covered Pyrenees mountain range with two Frenchmen and a Belgian captain, Belgium army captain. She transmitted a message to London that said, Cuthbert is giving me trouble, but I can cope. Her message was received and an unknown staffer replied, if Cuthbert is giving you trouble, have him eliminated. Well, of course, Cuthbert was her prosthetic limb. And on the 19th of January, 1943, after two weeks of walking across the snow-covered Pyrenees, she finally boarded her clipper flight to London. She would eventually return to France, but not as an SOE agent, but as an OSS agent, the Office of Strategic Services, SOE's US equivalent and the forerunner to the CIA established after the war. William Donovan, the head of the OSS and President Harry Truman, awarded Virginia the Distinguished Service Cross, making her the only woman in the Second World War to earn that honour. Now, Virginia had a penchant for firsts because on the 3rd of December 1951, she became one of the first women officers to be admitted to CIA headquarters. But at 45 years of age, Virginia found it difficult to have the family she had so much desired with her husband, 
a fellow OSS veteran. Many female agents found that they were unable to conceive because of the devastating effects on their bodies of the stress and malnutrition and pill taking that came with operating behind enemy lines during the war. In her new job working for the CIA, Virginia had made friends with an unmarried secretary who was pregnant, a very scandalous situation to be in during the 1950s. But with her husband's blessing, Virginia made an offer to adopt the child, and the three entered into serious discussions about the idea. But in the end, it did not happen. And although the reasons are not clear, there was evidently disappointment. Virginia and her husband soon after that began to collect poodles. And sadly, Virginia was never to have a family of her own. So SOEs are regular women like Virginia Hall are perhaps not names that we are all familiar with. Their courage and accomplishments are not as widely known as they should be. Virginia Hall demonstrated how women were capable of extraordinary courage and ingenuity that helped to change the outcome of the war. While the context of the war removed some of the tensions between the two trades of intelligence and journalism, the wartime legacy of cooperation and trust would be very short lived because the Cold War produced a very different and contested landscape of secrecy. Thank you very much for listening. Wow, that was absolutely amazing, Claire. Thank you. Oh gosh, it's just <laughs> incredible what these truly extraordinary women were capable of. And also I think the um the intelligence, the just the general cleverness of the, the secret war of being able to discuss the economy, discuss the general living conditions of French and have again that open source intelligence, I think is is really remarkable and ingenious. Um and ingenious. Well. I'm going to kick off the questions with one of my own questions. I'm so sorry, guys. Please, again, put questions in, in the chat and I will absolutely ask them. Um, but my question is about um, what you mentioned about the Secret Intelligence Services, the MI6, and sort of what we you mentioned about uh, irregular warfare. And um, I'm very interested in irregular warfare. I would say that I've been exposed to irregular warfare as a veteran of the Afghanistan campaign. And it is a very different way to fight a war. So I think um, it's quite interesting and I'd just like to sort of get your take on it and on why the MI6 really didn't like the SOE. When we know that the SOE had really strict sort of characteristics, almost like job descriptions that they needed their agents to have, um, their training was, was really hard work. I mean, guerrilla training is not fun. Um, I have done counterinsurgency training and trench warfare and ugh, it's not fun. It's, it's, it's hard work. And um, for women at the time to do something so physical as that, it, it's, it's quite, quite impressive. And um, so why then do you think that, you know, when we're in 1940, 1941, the war is not going well for Britain. Um, you know, we're on back foot. We want everything, all hands on deck. So why do you think the SIS really was quite reluctant to see this alternative organisation come forth? And I would argue that maybe they weren't spies and they were more agents, almost like a secret army, as Churchill probably would have mentioned. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the I think it comes down to how SOE is established, what it's born out of. Um, and it's born out of Section D, which is within, which is kind of like the, the covert ops section within MI6. And not a lot of people know this about Bletchley Park's um, history, but when in the first few months of war on Bletchley Park, um, Section D are actually there, they're blowing things up, they're using the workshops on the site to come up with ingenious gadgets. Um, but, you know, the code breakers that are happening, they they they... They don't want that kind. They don't want things being blown up. Um, so they ask them to move. But the, our SOE is born out of Section D, which is D for destruction. So it's sabotage and subversion. And our SOE, SOE is born out of that. Mengis is particularly put out because he doesn't find out that they the SOE is being created out of this until three weeks after it's actually happened. 
So he's not a for informed at the time, he's informed after, three weeks after. So that puts his no nose out of, pushes it out of joint. And also he doesn't like um, Brigadier Gubbins, who is heading SOE. They absolutely loathe each other. So that doesn't make for a perfect... <laughs> um, a perfect start really to, to SOE which has to hit the ground running um, and it has to find it well it has it has to sort of slot in um, and I guess find its place but I think the one thing that's always struck me about SOE and there are a lot of people from who were in MI6 section D that come through uh, people like Lawrence Grand, who was in charge of, of Section D, that come through to SOE, um, and lots of other in individuals like George Coulthard, um, of famous, you know, clothing, etc. He comes through as well. But the more and more, I the more time I spend researching SOE, I think perhaps because it is, you know, it's a baptism by fire in terms of it literally has to hit the ground running that the people that it recruits into its organization are entrepreneurial i think if you want to give it the modern a modern word um they are faced with a whole bunch of problems and they have to come up with solutions and it's creative thinking at its best um so yeah the more and more i look at them the more i think wow you know they they did pretty well um considering <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's so interesting to almost feel like the secret intelligence service had the monopoly on intelligence and clandestine warfare. And then suddenly this this new bravado organization crops up and says, no, we just want to go over and blow things up. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, so I can see I can see where the, the working relationship may not have been the best. Yeah. But I think also at this time, the, the idea of conventional warfare is such a doctrinally part of the armed forces. Mm -hmm. I think the SOE is very progressive in how it combats literally a conventional force. And I would argue that the armed forces, um, the British Army, elements of the Royal Air Force, a land elements of the a Royal Navy, definitely still take, I'd say, lessons from be having to fight a conventional force and have using irregular warfare and we now know that irregular or what we call asymmetric warfare is so prevalent in how we fight wars today so i think gosh they're so progressive in mm. their understanding of war and how how to fight the war in a very different way so i i just find it so interesting that of course they're going to rub people up the wrong way because it's it's a it's a way that they haven't fought a conventional war like that perhaps before um, in, in a British sense, that is. And I mean, the European nations absolutely had guerrilla tactics during the Waterloo campaign and things like that. Um, but I just, yeah, I always find it really interesting how re the relationship they sort of didn't like each other and they were like, oh, you're on my turf and stop this. Yeah, I think, I think there's two, I think there's two levels. I think at the top level, there is that, um, the dislike, but I think in terms of operationally at the lower levels, as we know, there are people that are collaborating, actually working together. Um, so I think there's two, two levels going. I don't think everybody hated each other in MI6 and SOE. What you can see in the files is actually there is collaboration at certain points. But it was it was a big problem when you've got MI6 agents operating behind enemy lines in, say, Paris, and then they bump into an SOE. <laughs> agent who probably is doing the same thing trying to establish networks etc for intelligence gathering purposes so operationally it is it is a problem um and i had a in terms of bringing it up to sort of making those present day connections it's interesting with ukraine when when the russia invaded ukraine um and i was talking with with one individual um who was actually going to the ukraine to help i won't say in what capacity but he joked but it was a serious joke that actually he said oh i'm gonna have a look at the ideas of what soe did oh amazing because you know, some of those tricks um and some of those those um ideas i think you, you can still apply now in a present day context in terms of guerrilla warfare oh just that's incredible that's <laughs> which awesome. i thought i hadn't thought of in I hadn't made that connection at all mm. um but um 
but yeah so that that was that was particularly interesting um and of course women again in ukraine taking up arms oh yes absolutely it's that is this sort of this understanding that the nature of warfare never changes it's just the evolution of its weapons and how we wage for, war will always change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that nature to want to serve your country and um want to do what you can and you're going to find ways and methods to do that and obviously lots of ways and those methods are drawn from history mm. i think that's really interesting mm. we have a couple of questions one of the questions i particularly like from tim um he says he'd be very interested to find out about her crossing route of the pyrenees now i'm very interested in this as well tim because it's something that i would actually like to do when when i'm a little bit uh, um, a little bit fitter and have done a little bit more training um so her route she did she cross the Pyrenees in I want to say November because it was a really awful awful weather to cross the Pyrenees it was it, yeah terrible and she was about two weeks it took and you can imagine with a prosthetic you know it would have it, it was it would be bleeding it would be sore I mean it would how on earth she did it I cannot imagine I mean mentally strong um to to keep going um because even as an able-bodied person um that's a hard trek to do oh. um but um and, and especially you know if you're thinking about her condition physically as well before she embarks on that trek across the pyrenees she'll have been malnutrition she wouldn't be like us now in the 21st century fit and healthy she would have been facing you know she would have been severely malnutritioned severely underweight um so again then in terms of how on earth i guess well it's pushing your body to the extreme isn't it um but she but she managed it but yeah no it would be an amazing i've always it's always been in the back of my mind but i always think objectively that i need to be a lot fitter i think <laughs> before before i even um attempted that but um yes it would be nice to retrace um a sort of a commemorative walk mm. in honor honor of her because that really is that's, that's some feat to do that well we can do it together claire there you are we can absolutely pull each other along, <laughs> pull each other along. yeah <laughs> it'll be fine right we have another question from paul uh he says would you happen to know offhand how many female agents were in were in place i'm i'm assuming it's slightly wrong um were um parachuted yeah. yes by, by parachute drop um my understanding is that several soe agents were but no americans so the oss were so um yes i'm aware that soe agents were um some women soe agents like nancy wake for example um Pat, there's a really funny story about her parachuting into france um do you know is there a specific reason why oss didn't particularly like that route or did they like that route was there an well, it's the, yeah it's the most riskiest parachute dropping because you're dropping blind in effect in the sense of if the resistance um groups on the on on the ground um if they if they're not in place when they should be or for whatever reason you know you the the weather throws you know the airplane off course and you're not dropping in to where you should be dropping you suddenly find that you're dropping into tree cover um etc it, it's extremely risky um you know and you could injure yourself in the drop which which is why it's risky i mean obviously virginia hall didn't drop um because of her prosthetic limb um so it was the safer option to go via boat over land um or lysander plane and, and land um, which was the preferred i've no I, it's a good question i've i've just made a note of it to to look to see what the actual number is um i don't recall <laughs> remember seeing um a nice number that someone's put somewhere which makes me wonder there perhaps isn't as many as what you would think have been parachuted in um, i think it's quite a romanticized uh understanding of, of the secret agent parachuting into enemy lines but there's so many other ways that they absolutely they... yeah and i mean you when you parachute in you're wearing your um uh, striptease suit so you might also have um a bag attached to your leg carrying supplies or extra clothing 
um you know and it's once you've dropped you've got to take off your striptease suit you've got to bury it you know you've got your um your spade and handle which again in little pockets you've got a revolver um so you've got a lot of things to do when you hit the ground um so again you know that's all all risky and especially if the germans are in that area doing night searches etc but you've got to make sure you bury all that stuff <laughs> before you can even get moving um it all takes time um but yeah no it's that's it's an interesting question i don't have the answer i'm afraid sorry paul um but hopefully that's given a little bit of context and i've made a note to look it up no that would be very interesting um i just have a question about her mental resilience because it always strikes me the resilience these women had and it's not like today when I was thinking about joining the army you know I watched Band of Brothers I thought the medic episode was cool so I was like oh I'm gonna be a medic so I joined the army as a medic so I had lots of external influences imagery that I could draw upon to understand what a role in the British army would be like for me as a, as a person and I just find it really remarkable that these women it wouldn't have had that information yet the mental resilience they showed is just phenomenal Look, talking about Virginia Hall with a prosthesis that absolutely would have caused her to bleed would have been ill-fitted it wouldn't have been anywhere near what we've got today uh, or people like Noreen Yak Khan uh, such a young woman, you know, so brave, um, staying in Paris when the whole network had, had folded. Um, do you think that resilience was an innate trait and was it picked out by the recruitment process of the SOE, do you think, or was it built through the training? What do you think about that? I think it's generational. I think, um, and I think it's the impact for some of these women who, especially the French women who've come from parts of northern France that were, you know, the battlefield during the First World War. And now again, they're facing the same scenario um, that, you know, their, their homes are occupied and they've got the prospect of their men dying again. Um, for those that were the British, Virginia Hall, I mean, for the British women, I think generationally looking across MI6, MI5, um, I don't think they make them that way anymore. And I think it's because they 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 were such a steadfast belief in the legitimacy of the state and patriotism, um, which now we like we are we are more critical of the of the state and its decisions that it makes, um, and we have more information to inform. Um, our thinking and decisions but I think generationally these the British women in particular I think it's from what I from my experience so far of looking in at individual case studies I think that is perhaps the motivator and then of course when they come through training I think the recruiters are spotting who has got that particular resolve to to carry on till the end that they will not you know they will not um be defeated um but in terms of people i mean like virginia hall i mean she all these women they're, they're born before their time you know they were born into an age when the world was not ready for them if they were born now can you imagine Virginia Hall? I always think Virginia Hall in the 21st century would just be even totally awesome she'd be like <laughs> heading up the un or something um but um but yeah, they're born at a time where, you know, the, the world is not quite ready for independent women that don't want to conform to societal norms of marriage and, you know, those kinds of things. They they, they want to carve their own paths. Um, and she's not alone in that. And I think that's what drives her um, in particular. I, th I think as well, her... her sort of the challenges she faced and the rejection she faced in her early life always to me felt like it sort of built this inner steel mm -hmm. and I always find it very interesting when she moved from SOE to the OSS because SOE was sort of like oh, well you've, you've mm -hmm. kind of done your job now and uh, you know she's like well no I, I'm not finished and I think that's so wonderful and testament to her 
you know, that inner metal that she wants to continue to serve um, mm. operationally in uh, an intelligence capacity. Mm. And I just, I find that so phenomenal. And I just, what a trailblazer. I'm, I, I definitely feel that um, those are the women that allowed me and my female colleagues to wear uniform mm. uh, because they, they just, that non-conformist stance and just, just that inner metal, it just, it always blows me away a little bit always blows me away well um, yeah i mean it's it's really hard to even try and grasp isn't it the idea that somebody keeps telling you no because you're a woman no 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 most people would go away after 10 times of hearing no 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 but these women know they stayed and they were like we will find a way um we will find a way to achieve what we want to achieve um whether that's completely sledgehammering the glass ceiling or whether it's chipping it away so that other women coming up behind um, can really smash that glass ceiling. Um, it is quite amazing. Um, when, I, when I think of words like the meaning of the word courage and bravery, it's these women in particular that are always the ones that come first. I know I work on them, but you know it's, they are first and foremost um, their sort of visual imprints in my memory with those words attached to them and their their deeds but um, yeah it's quite phenomenal I mm. guess extreme circumstances need need those kinds of people don't they to step up and they do thankfully yes thank you thank goodness mm. um, and I know this this is your passion and you've been working on this for many years um, and I actually uh, sort of only stumbled across um, SOE as a very junior private soldier just before um, I deployed to Afghanistan. I was out for a run and I stumbled across the film Odette um, on Channel 5 one afternoon, one Sunday afternoon. I thought, what? Who is this, you know, badass woman mm. on screen doing <laughs> resistancy things? And I thought it was utterly incredible and so impressive. And that's sort of started sparked my um really great love interest of these wonderful women but do you think that um we're historians we love them we know about them we want to talk about them do you think that society is starting to really delve into this woman's narrative of war because there was a recent film out called um, a call to spy um and i've that it's on it's on Netflix, I think, or Amazon Prime. Yeah. So it's on a big uh, network. Do you mm. think that that fascination? Do you think it's becoming more prevalent? Do you think it's because of that generation starting to die off? Do you think that we're now at a point in society the cultural turns fin not finished, but the cultural turn just created and enabled us to talk about women and create this narrative, and people are really buying into it because they want to know about these women. They want to know about the Britain secret war and who was in it and how we fought it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we're doing, we're doing, no, I mean, I think um, I think one Second World War history is just there's an insatiable appetite for it and you throw in spies and secret intelligence and that just like boom you know it just kind of explodes and you can see that when you go into like waterstones and look at the non-fiction um section that there is a real appetite for this and i think it's driven partly for a number of reasons that you know we are on the edge of living history um just like what happened with the first world war so we will soon lose that connection to um i mean there's only there's only a handful. Um, there's Phyllis Latour. I think she may be, maybe only, I don't know, five female um, operational agents. I mean, there are obviously women in SOE that weren't behind enemy lines that are still alive um, and had really super um, interesting jobs. Um, but yeah, we're on the edge of living history. And there, you know, there is this big push for, for writing women back into historical narratives writing them back <laughs> into history um and in in particular i mean this is one of the reasons why i'm writing money penny um is writing women back into the history of british intelligence because it's i mean it's changing now slightly but it has been for a field for a very very long time men writing about men um 
which is fine up until a certain point, once you get those key operational narratives written, but you then want to ask, well, who, who, who are in these operational narratives? It's not just men, it's women as well. And women are the cornerstone of British intelligence work in every capacity. They are what make everything possible. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, just like with um, Yanina Ramirez's book, writing uh, medieval women back into history, um, you know, there is a real push to, I guess, provide a much more democratic and equal history. Um, and, you know, women might not necessarily be in the formal archival records because they're the ones that are creating them. So yeah. we have to think as historians, well, what other kinds of material can we look at to, to find them? Because they are there. They're just forgotten about at the moment. Oh, I love that. And, and um, I'm really glad you, you brought up your book because I think because of Ian Fleming's James Bond, I think we've almost, it's almost become cultural memory um, that you've got the suave, confident <laughs> male spy who can do everything, who can ski, who can water ski, who can jet ski. Like, I mean, the amount of things James Bond could do, and I think to myself, gosh, he must have an awful bad back. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you really must. And I think that's really interesting what you said, um, women being the cornerstone of intelligence, because you have Money Penny, who is his handler almost, who is always there, always with key information, always giving him his travel docs. You need to do this and you need to do that. And without Money Penny, who you know, who is James Bond? Can he be James Bond? And what an interesting narrative to delve into. Um, and I absolutely can't wait. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm absolutely going to bug you and email you and be like, would you mind um, signing my book? That'd be fab. Yeah. Uh, so um, <laughs> I think that's so, um, so, so wonderful a narrative. And, and that's really a, kind of made me think about it in a really different way, which is really fantastic. And what we should be doing when we're thinking about these, these women agents. Um, and I think also because F section in particular, um has there's been so more written on them than other sections i think what opening out these narratives does especially for, with virginia because it opens out the S -S -O um, sos oss oh, narrative mm -hmm. and i think that's really great because then you're opening out the other sections um like czechoslovakia poland uh where mm -hmm. women were also really prevalent and part of that narrative and where are they Mm -hmm. um you know let's get let's get these narratives let's let's bring them into mm -hmm. the fold let's center women's war stories part of the war story mm -hmm. um so i think this is so interesting and so relevant work today um that it's just yeah just fantastic so your book um miss money penny is just going to be so great in helping to fill that gap and build that narrative um which i just i can't wait honestly i can't wait for it um, I wish I, I wish I could say more. It's absolutely killing me that I can't. <laughs> I have to wait until the summer of 2024. But yeah, here's your disclaimer. I'll be shouting it from the rooftops thereafter. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> we'll have you back on to talk yeah, about no, it. Thank Don't you. worry. <laughs> um, uh, if there's any last questions, guys, please pop them in the chat. Um, if you haven't got any questions, um, please thank Claire in the chat as well. Um, I'm sure I say it for everyone that, you know, this really was a, fantastic talk um what what an amazing woman what a trailblazer her qualities and the way you know the cleverness of it all as well I always get kind of astounded by how clever um all of the the SOE were that entre entrepreneurial attitude that that kind of you know using open source intelligence which I think people sometimes think oh no it's all codes and well no it doesn't have to be intelligence can be um is any form really you take intel and you turn it into intelligence and i think that's really interesting um oh we've got a question pop up fantastic um what are some of the alternate sources used to detect the women's participation really interesting so it's 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 um family records it's oh. personal um so once you've identified the women then tracking down um, surviving descendants um, if they're not alive and then seeing whether there are any personal files, diaries, letters, photographs have survived. That's really interesting. 
that's really interesting because I, I I'm assuming because um I think there's a gendered kind of issue here is that women don't like to be called veterans and women don't identify with the ver- wor- the word veteran so I think that's really interesting because yes of course that's where you would find and that's really prevalent I'd never thought about that um yeah so it's the realm, realms of the, um, I guess, what you would call the social historian, the family historian, of looking at those types of personal informal records, which, you know, sometimes provide the glue um, to knit together some of the um, archival records. So there could be some quite exciting discoveries made. I'm just going to make a note of that. For you just... things that I'll be doing with you. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Um, oh, do you know what? I didn't think about this question. It's a very good question from Justin. So the one I just mentioned was from Linda. So this is from Justin. Did Virginia and the other women's service during the war lead to a general opening of roles within British intelligence in the post-war period? Or did the traditional male-female divides return again? I'd love to say there was a general opening, but there wasn't. <laughs> because unfortunately, just like what happened with the First World War, when British intelligence expanded rapidly, um same happened second world war expanded rapidly and then it contracted just as quick at the war's end and a lot of women um were laid off um a lot of the women some of the women did stay on um but there were still the traditional male female divisions um in terms of women do clerical work um you know they don't get to become i mean mi6 i think to give them their due even though they haven't had any women apart from Judy Dench, fictional head of service. Um, I think MI6 perhaps are the more, the better of the agencies that they did appoint um, women as officers, perhaps early on in the interwar period. And you've got Jane Archer or Jane Sismore as she was um, being the first female MI5 officer in 1929. but yeah, the, the traditional male female divisions were were very much still in place um, because, of course, if if women were going to succeed, it was men making that happen. Oh, so it's uh, yeah, you I mean, you have women performing in um, doing the roles of, of, of officers, but not without that. That label because they are a woman. Hmm. it's really interesting and it's really fascinating that um we strive for that equality we strive for the opportunity and sometimes the gender itself is the facilitating factor which i think is very interesting for the soe um and the secret intelligence services where they see an operational value in a woman and it's her gender rather than her skills uh, I think that's really fascinating, and I, I would probably argue that there is still a sense of that in our modern armies, our modern standing armies, in that um, you know there's a, a high proportion of women in the Royal Army Medical Corps and the um, Queen Alexandra's Nursing Corps, and um, because there's still those traditional roles, so I definitely see that legacy, I felt that legacy, Um, And I think it's very interesting. I think we're at a turning point in our armed forces now, where even though women as of 2018 are now allowed on the front line, um, but gosh, there is still a lot of push, shall we say. (laughs) And I think it's really interesting when we bring it back to the Ukraine um, and looking at what's happening now in the world and that you see, again, that, that gendered, term of combatant is undermined undermined by just the phenomenon of war and in ukraine absolutely you know they just need bodies on the front line male or female Mm -hmm. so it's so interesting that um in war sometimes operationally to be a woman is good and then Mm -hmm. um when war finishes no get back to those societal roles and then again when war happens again in the 21st century um Mm -hmm. and you, you see women again being involved in war and it's, it's such an interesting kind of seesaw throughout history mm. uh and i i mean who who knows i think the change there is change but it's it's change is slow um but it's it's such an interesting concept to kind of study and mm. absolutely women like virginia and to, to an extent miss money penny um they they've 
they're trailblazers for us. Absolutely. I've definitely felt that you know, I stood on the shoulders of the women before me for certain. Um, we've had lots of thank yous on the chat, which has just been wonderful. Um, and I can say as well, thank you so much from the museum and from myself. It's just what a wonderful talk. So, so well researched and so many interesting things. It's just made my brain open up on a <laughs> Sunday afternoon. I have to go for a walk to try and calm myself <laughs> down. So it's really wonderful. So um, I will stop the recording there. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined us.